Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for this event. I'm calling in a conversation with Loretta J. Ross. Um, we are so excited to have Loretta with us today. My name is Hari Han and I'm the director of the SNF Agora Institute. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're an academic and public forum at Johns Hopkins University that's dedicated to improving and expanding global democracy um, with civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as a cornerstone of making democracy work all over the world. Um, I want to thank both the Provost Office and the Office of the Dean of Student Life for co-hosting the event with us today. And I also wanna thank Hopkins student organizations, female leaders of color, the Multicultural Leadership Council and the Foreign Affairs Symposium for partnering with us and supporting us in this event. And of course, thank you to, to Professor Ross for her time with us to participate in this important conversation. Professor Ross, as many of you know, is an activist, author, public intellectual, and professor at Smith College, whose work and courses focus on call-out culture and white supremacy. So welcome, Loretta, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you um, for such a warm welcome. Oh, we're so excited to have you. Um, so for all of you who are here with us, um, our discussion this evening will focus, will examine a phenomenon that's commonly being called call-out culture. And we're gonna focus on, our on an alternative that Professor Ross has advocated to explore how calling in can be a different way to advance social justice. A healthy democracy requires all of us to participate no matter who we are and what identities, affiliations, beliefs, or creeds that we bring to the table. And so we wanna to try to think about how we can create a space where all voices can be heard. And so Professor Ross will walk us through ways in which she has um, learned how to have the kinds of conversations, the difficult conversations that are necessary to create the kind of understanding and empathy that we need. And so this conversation is gonna be um, moderated by two student moderators. And I'm very pleased to introduce our student moderators from Flock and MLC. And this time I invite them both to turn their cameras on. And so, um, move, there you go. Um, so Mufi Adedoyen is president of Female Leaders of Color and a junior at Johns Hopkins University studying economics and international studies. And, and we also have with us Melanie Piaca Gutierrez, who is director of internal communications for the Multicultural Leadership Council and also a junior at Johns Hopkins, also studying economics and international studies. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And I'm gonna turn the conversation over to Mufi and Melanie. Hello everyone, thank you again, uh, Dr. Han for that introduction and everyone for attending as well and Dr. Ross for being here, Professor Ross. Um, I am Mufi as mentioned earlier and I'm the president of Female Leaders of Color. A little bit of background on Female Leaders of Color, uh, we're also known as FLOC and we aim to provide a space for women of color to establish a sisterhood committed to improving their academic and social environments on campus as well as the surrounding Baltimore community. Um, Melanie, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself in MLC. Thanks, Mufi, and thanks everyone for the introductions, for being here, um, Professor Ross, for joining us today. Um, my name is Melanie. I'm the I'm a director that's part of the Multicultural Leadership Council, um, which is a governing board comprised of like 35 plus cultural organizations on campus. Um, and we really strive to encourage student leaders to develop their leadership, um, collaborate with each other, and engage in important conversations like the one we're going to have tonight. Um, and yeah, so I'm also very honored to have the opportunity to introduce Loretta J. Ross. Um, professor Ross is an associate professor at Smith College in the program for the study of women and gender. She teaches courses on white supremacy, human rights, and calling in the calling out culture. Professor Ross is also an activist with 50 years of experience in social justice activism and community organizing. As an activist, Ross has been involved in anti-apartheid, anti-gentrification activism, and has worked to prevent violence against women. She co-created the theory of reproductive justice in 1994 as an activist. Um, Professor Ross has held countless leadership positions, including national co-director for the March for Women's Lives, the largest protest march in the history of the United States with 1.15 million participants. A public intellectual, Professor Ross speaks, trains, consults, and lectures on a multitude of issues such as human rights, violence against women, reproductive justice, appropriate whiteness, and of course, call out culture and calling in. Her newest book, Calling In the Calling Out Culture, will be released later this year. Welcome, Professor Ross. Oh, welcome. That was a wonderful introduction, and thank you. 
Uh, it's an honor to be here. I want to start my timer so that I don't go over time because we want to leave plenty of room for Q&A. And I'm going to share my PowerPoint with y'all. Um, actually, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping okay. for our audience. Um, so Professor Ross's presentation will last for about 40 minutes, then we will take questions from the audience. Please submit your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A function. Melanie and I will then choose questions to pose live to Professor Ross. Um, the chat function has been turned off for comments so that we can use it to share any relevant information with attendees. And we'll be recording today's conversation and the recorded version will be available on the SNF Agora Institute website and YouTube channel. Now I'll turn the conversation back over to Professor Ross. Okay, well, I really appreciate that. We'll get our timing down eventually, right? <laughs> well, as I said, I have been an organizer and community activist for, oh, since I was 16 years old. So I've been doing this work for 51 years. And I started as a freshman at Howard University right up the road from y'all. And now I live in Atlanta. So let me get to the screen sharing so that I can maximize the time. Hopefully you can see the screen. A yes would be good. Yes, we can see the screen. <laughs> okay. This is important, so make sure that I'm not just talking to myself. You could also hear me, right? Yes. yes. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I created this concept of calling in the calling out culture because I noticed how mean people were being online to each other. When I finally was compelled to get on Facebook, in order to keep up with my grandson that apparently couldn't answer the phone because everything went to voicemail. And he told me to, oh, grandma, if you wanna you know, reach me, get on Facebook. Well, of course, the minute I got on Facebook, he got off because he said it was for old fogies. So I stayed on Facebook because I didn't follow him to TikTok or wherever he migrated to. And that's when I noticed how mean people were being with each other. So five years ago, I started offering trainings to people about calling in the calling out culture. And the reason I thought I could offer these trainings, because after doing the work for almost 50 years, I've taught black feminist theory to men, black men who were incarcerated for raping and murdering women. I've deprogrammed white supremacists when I did anti-fascist work. So I've had a lot of experience having difficult conversations with people I wouldn't necessarily bring home for dinner. And so when I saw what was happening in the call out culture, I thought I could use my life as an intellectual biography to offer advice, wisdom, elderhood, whatever it is, so that we can actually transform our calling out culture into a calling in culture. Once I started doing it, then it kind of blew up. And then you see me on Morning Joe and I guess that's CBS and stuff like that. Actually, more people know me for creating the theory of reproductive justice, because I've co-written three books on that, than for calling in call, the calling out culture. But as you know, when you've been around for a long, long time, you actually get to do a lot of different things. I would also add that I've got a calling in training, particularly for the Black community with Sonia Renee Taylor, who wrote The Body is Not an Apology. Uh, it starts April 21st. Uh, for, for four consecutive Wednesdays, and you can get on my mailing list at LorettaRoss.com, LorettaJRoss.com, and each training is only $5. Everything I ever do is only $5 for these uh, large group trainings and stuff, and for those not in the African-American community or the Black community, there's a general one that I'm co-training with Not Long Tron, June 1st, starting June 1st, and he's the a young Vietnamese, queer Vietnamese uh, a person who created the concept of calling in when he wrote about it in Black Girl Dangerous. And so please join me again if you want to come to the general uh, open to all training. That's June 1. And you can also find out that information on my mailing list. Again, $5. So I want to also start with a quote from Toni Morrison 
about the calling in process, but I'm also gonna start talking about white supremacy because you know that's what I teach. What is now known is all what you are capable of knowing. You are your own stories and therefore free to imagine and experience what it means to be human without wealth. What it feels to, like to be human without domination over others, without reckless arrogance, without fear of others unlike you, without rotating, rehearsing, and reinventing the hatreds you learned in the sandbox. And that's the essence of calling in. We are going to learn how to be human with each other across these racial divides, across these gender identity divides, across the class, the immigration, all of these divides that really work to keep us separated from each other so that we can face forward looking all the tremendous uh, problems of our society, not the least of which is that we have people dedicated to overthrowing democracy if they can't permanently control it. I am a member of the human rights movement. You can see from the circles that I consider there, there to be a lot of components of the human rights movement. I don't have room to put all of them up there because I'm a feminist. I'm obviously part of the women's rights wing but I care about racial justice. I'm part of the civil rights wing and I'm also dis disabled. So I'm a part of the disability rights wing of the human rights movement. But I care about all those issues up there and most of us are walking coalitions caring about all those issues. We are sectors of the same human rights movement. But even though we focus on different things, we've got to figure out how we can work better together as a human rights movement. So I'm also going to bring up a quote from Thurgood Marshall, for whom, uh, of course, uh, the BWI airport is named after, if I'm not mistaken. In recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. And for those who don't know, Thurgood Marshall was the first Black member of the Supreme Court. I always start my trainings with these dueling narratives of the United States. When France gifted to us the Statue of Liberty in the late 1800s, we didn't know what to make of this statue because they were actually awarding it to us because they said after the Civil War, we had, they thought we had made the decision whether or not we were going to be a land dedicated to liberty, liberty or a land dedicated to slavery. And for most people who see the Statue of Liberty, they don't even notice that she has broken chains around her feet, signaling the, end, the ending of slavery. And you'd think that the Civil War would have decided that question once and for all, like France assumed. But again, it did not, because we still are in the middle of America's unfinished Civil War with the insurrection at the US Capitol on January 6th, trying to prevent the votes from being counted because black people voted in droves and elected President Biden and Vice President Harris. And they literally did not want those votes counted. Matter of fact, they are accusing, all, making all kinds of accusations around election fraud and stolen elections simply because they did not like the outcome of the election. So they're willing to overthrow democracy with that very poignant haunting image of a noose there, which means a lot of specific messages to people of color in this country. And this was all predictable because Ulysses S. Grant became president four years after Lincoln was assassinated. And he said, if we're going to have another civil war, I predict that the dividing line will be Mason and Dixon, will not be Masons and Dixon, but between patriotism and intelligence on one side and superstition ambition and ignorance on the other. And now we have a country split by patriotism and intelligence on one side and superstition, ambition, and ignorance on the other. Because he faced many insurrections by the Confederates from the South. And so all of what we're going through was eminently predictable if we learn to look at history. And my Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Barbara Jordan, from Texas I said, what we want, what the people want is very simple. They want an America as good as his promise. 
And Charles Mills wrote the racial contract about the state of white supremacy in our country by saying that the fish does not see the water and whites do not see the racial, racial nature of a white polity because they, it is natural to them, the element in which they move. So this starts me with a conversation about understanding the difference between blame versus responsibility. None of us alive can be blamed for the system that we have. Nobody is as old as Methuselah. But we all bear responsibility for ending the system of white supremacy. It's like if you buy a house and you want to live in this house and the house has bad, bad plumbing, you're not responsible. You're not, you're not to be blamed for the bad plumbing because the plum, bad plumbing existed before you bought the house. But if you're gonna live in that house and enjoy the privileges of living in a house, then you have responsibility for fixing that plumbing. And that's how we are in America. None of us created the system that we inherited, but we all have responsibility for fixing it. And so I'm gonna start by talking about how does white supremacy hurt white people as a way of talking about why we need to do a calling in culture because replicating this culture of violence is not helpful. That first of all, there's a conflation of white identity with white supremacy. White supremacy is a body of ideas, it's an ideology. It is not an identity because it's perfectly possible that you could be a white supremacist without being white and not all white people are white supremacists. So that's very important to make that separation because it leads to a lot of paralysis around the discussion of deconstructing white supremacy because white people often believe that we're trying to attack them personally and deconstruct their identity over which they have no control. And this of course is transmitted over and over again by multi-generational brainwashing. Also a problem is that, you know, we've got a situation in our country where people have been so brainwashed that they would deny benefits to themselves if it means denying them to black people. That's why we have so much resistance to the Affordable Care Act by white people who would actually benefit from the Affordable Care Act. But if they are afraid that immigrants will get health care or black people will get health care or whoever they define as undeserving will get health care, they'd rather not have health care. And Jonathan Menzel has done this book called Dying of Whiteness that proves that. And then it produces these feelings of guilt, shame, and justification instead of learning about how to have joy, being responsible for fixing this situation. And a lot of times people feel silenced for fear of saying the wrong thing, feeling like they're walking on eggshells, or actually won't even get believed when they tell their truth about how they're wrestling with trying to live whiteness differently. And then we really have a lot of people, we're in a culture of unforgiveness because if you make a mistake, you get punished for it and all of that. And that's part of the call out culture. And so people want to be forgiven for their past thoughts and behaviors, but they're afraid if they tell you about their past thoughts and behaviors that they will get punished, they will get shamed, they will get exiled because that's the call out culture. And that's based on these artificial binaries of good, bad, right, wrong, good, evil. I mean, we these binaries are actually hurting us because life is far more complicated and people are far more complex than we're giving them credit for being. And I always say, except that people are as complicated as you are. And so we pursue perfectionism and presume that we're objective when neither of those things are true. And that's another way that the call out culture hurts us, but that's also a legacy of white supremacy culture. And we actually can't separate criticisms about racist behaviors or words because when you say something is racist or you say something is hurtful and you feel the need to call people out, people experience that as if you're violating and talking about their moral character, not their words, not their behaviors, because there's this conflation between their identity, their character, and the words and the belief systems that they have. And sometimes people feel like they're on information overload. I can't take any more. I'm tired of all this wokeness. I'm tired of this. And then I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to be called out for saying that I'm tired of all this wokeness. So they really walk around 
silencing and censoring themselves because they dare not give voice to their own truths, their own feelings of ambiguity or confusion. And particularly the call outs that I most observe happen among groups of white people because the, there's the good white people who think they wanna separate themselves from the bad white people and say that they're more racist because the only time they wanna use the word racism is around the KKK or the Aryan nation. And then yet when they try to show how woke they are to people of color, they worry about being written off because they still may say something problematic even as they've signaled how woke they are. And so America, the pundits try to say we're a divided country. I don't think we're a divided country. I think white people are divided over the very same question that Dr. King asked, are we gonna have chaos our community? Because white supremacy and democracy are fundamentally incompatible. And these norms are reinforced by so many euphemisms like that the media uses to avoid saying white people, they invisibilize it. So I'm gonna keep this list up here for a short while. Locate some words that you're familiar with like Midwesterners, they mean white people. Christians, they mean white people. You know, elected officials, they mean white people. Voters, they mean white people. You get my drift. So the calling in con continuum is what I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about. I think we all know what calling out is. That's publicly shaming somebody for something they've said or how they look or who they are. And it always is about, at least in the people's mind, an attempt to get accountability, but by through the vehicle of public shaming and blaming and calling out. There's an intermediate step called calling on. Calling on is not a call out, but it's also not a call in because a call in requires an investment in someone else's growth. Calling on is that intermediate step where you don't call them out, but you just say something that's an, an, in, like an inquiry. You say, I beg your pardon when somebody has said something that doesn't land well with you and you're not calling them out or you're not investing in them. But I just find that phrase, I beg your pardon, and you just let it lay there for a minute. And they kind of process in their own heads that they said something problematic. And then you can either walk away or engage them in a calling in if you have the time, patience, and temperament. But mostly I'm gonna focus on calling in. Now, one of the things that the right wings are saying a whole lot about the cancel culture is that they're the victims of it right now. But as you can see from this cartoon, you know, I, I love this cartoon. It says, you may call it cancel culture, but it's well past time your cultures were canceled. And they're talking about the religious right with the My Pillow guy, the KKK, the woman with the QAnon hat on, the guy with the Nazi flag, and the guy with the Confederate flag. And I want you to notice that those last two figures are well armed. And so we really are understanding that there are appropriate uses of call out and cancels, but mainly we need to be careful that we not turn it into horizontal hostility. And there's a lot of conditions favorable to the call out culture because this mid-century conflict that's gonna happen in about 30 years when white people become a minority in a nation of minorities, and it's gonna create all of these fears about white ex extinction anxiety. And we see a lot of that happening now. And there's gonna be 200 million global refugees by the same time of the mid 21st century because of climate change. And so these porous borders of our nation states actually may become outmoded, useless, because right now they can't control the flow of information, businesses, money, crime, environmental problems, you know, people. And unfortunately, wars over resources are going to increase these numbers. And it's very well possible that the white supremacists who remain in power in our country may demand an upward, um, upgraded form of apartheid as a way to preserve their white privileges, because that's really the only way that a small minority of people can control the fate uh, of others is to establish an undemocratic system like apartheid. And they may even 
have perpetual wars both internally and externally to justify their holding on to the illegitimate, illegitimate power. And I also fear that we're gonna have scientific and technological developments that will upgrade our present inequalities and it will be worse. And all of these things will lead to a call out culture. And that's gonna require us developing racial courage, you know, because we have to be intentional about ending white supremacy. It ain't gonna disappear just because we ignore it, but we can't become the blame and shame gang calling each other out. And I do believe that if people are given the opportunities to learn and receive forgiveness for all of our inevitable mistakes, everyone can have these meaningful conversations with each other from our different diversities from the first day and throughout our entire learning process because our good intentions are not enough. We're gonna to have to unlearn unconscious habits in addressing differences because these unconscious habits trip us up and do more harm than good. And then when problems arise, we end up with a, in an opaque situation with active secrecy on difficult issues. Like if they happen on our college campuses, they just get referred to the black hole of HR, human resources instead of being openly aired and dealt with and, and solved. And it creates a lot of conflict between white students and students of color, as well as white faculty, uh, white, white staff and faculty and staff of color. And part of it is that binary thinking of thinking that race issues are only for students of color to deal with, gender issues only for women to deal with, disability issues are only for students, doesn't take into fact trans students, doesn't take in the track all the way that we have multiple identities and vulnerabilities if you use an intersectional lens. And then we end up doing the right thing the wrong way because we think that somehow we can solve this problem by having race segregated group or gender segregated groups or whatever. And that's the consequence of what I call problematic diversity, equity and inclusion training. And it really, doesn't work because it leaves white people to bring their questions to people of color. And it doesn't build up that empathy stamina, that empathy muscle that is so useful in our leadership development and developing better relationships in life. And so let's talk about a growth mindset that we can develop through calling in. Alicia Garza, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, asked a very poignant question. How do we build a world where many worlds fit? And so that means we're gonna to have to rethink calling out by avoiding that us versus them mentality, really by focusing on why we wanna do it, ourselves and our motives, make sure we don't sabotage our own strategies and keep delay our own outcomes because we think that being right by calling somebody else out is a better goal then establishing unity so that you can actually make change. And that requires building collaborations, avoiding that shaming and blame and ousting as punishment and revaluing our relationships because everyone wants to be heard, valued, respected, liked, and appreciated. If you accept that what you want is what everyone wants, you'll be go a long way. So calling in, calling in is actually a call out done with radical love to achieve accountability. So instead of putting somebody on full blast and saying, you said that word and it was wrong or you misgendered me or you didn't know that we're not colored people anymore. I mean, whatever you wanna get on your high horse about. It's about achieving accountability, not ignoring the harm, but choosing instead of putting somebody on blast, saying, you know, when you use that word, I'm not sure if I know what you meant when you said that. So do you mind if we go have coffee and talking about it? Or I know you misgendered me and it's okay. I misgender myself sometimes, but can we go talk about, you know, how we can both get better at remembering this kind of thing? I mean, that's all it takes. You still want to point out that harm was done but you're choosing not to jump down somebody's throat because harm was done. Because we inevitably all make mistakes and you have to create a culture of forgiveness in order to actually get correction of the mistake. And that starts by giving each other the benefit of the doubt, 
not assuming worse intentions just because something didn't land well with you. And you've got to acknowledge that diversity is our strength and that we're all on the same team and we're supposed to have differences of opinion. That's why we are a human rights movement and not a human rights cult. And that starts by remembering the broader context that editor in chief from Teen Vogue who got basically unhired or fired last week for a tweet she did when she was 17 years old, still being used and weaponized against her is wrong 10 years later. Because how many of us were stupid teenagers and we're kind of glad nobody has the receipt on how stupid we were as teenagers or none of us would get a job as an adult. So we're weaponizing the call out culture too much and creating injustices in our way. And that requires using active, loving listening practices, which can be learned in any therapeutic setting, facilitation training, and all of that, and be grateful for the opportunity to share this learning together and learning how to be better together. So it begins with self-assessment. You've got to analyze how you feel and why you want to call somebody out. You know, if you're not in a place where you've done your own healing, then you're not in a space to have that difficult conversation. So you don't have an obligation to call anybody in. You know, it's a choice you get to make over and over again. Because like I said, you can call on them or you can just walk away. And you really have to accept at the outset that you don't actually have the magical power to change somebody else's mind. You know, you can only offer that love and respect and then hope that they can accept it, but don't count on it because most people's epiphanies don't happen while there are witnesses around. And you may still disagree, but that's okay. Because again, we're supposed to have different opinions and all calling in starts with self-forgiveness. In my trainings, I ask people, how were your mistakes that you made as a child handled when you were a child? And I find how those mistakes were handled when you were a child is a strong predictor of how you handle other people's mistakes as an adult. So if you were punished as a child, shamed and blamed as a child for making a mistake, then you think it's normal for punishing and shaming and blaming people as an adult. But if you were counseled as a child when you were offered a chance to learn from your mistakes and you were offered grace and forgiveness, then it increases the likelihood that you're predisposed to offer that same kind of grace and forgiveness to others. So anybody taking this lecture or taking my training is always asked that question, how are your mistakes handled? And do you want to make a different choice? Because if your mistakes were not handled with love and forgiveness, do you still want to walk around in that wounded, traumatized way? Or do you want to make another choice? And a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of roles in calling in and, and in the calling in continuum. There's a person who was hurt. There's a person who speaks up on behalf of the person who was hurt. There's people who intervene in the escalation of the call out. Sometimes people want to build healing containers for the caller in and the caller out. Sometimes they're bystanders that don't even want to get involved in that mess for fear. They will be the next ones called out. Sometimes people witness what's going on and reflect back to the group. Oh, I saw this, this happened, and, and I need to give you that information. Sometimes you're the violator, the abuser. Sometimes people want to just create common ground among people. Like, this is what we all agree on. Let's focus on that while we put what we disagree on in the parking lot to get to it later. Some people just want to find out more facts and they ask questions or they actually uh, intentionally seek truth. And when you understand calling in, you really understand that what you're trying to do is create a process both internally for yourself and for the groups that you're involved in, in as a way of decreasing harm over time. Again, it's not about giving a pass to harm. It's a way to decrease it by working on it specifically with love and grace. But it is not the job of victim survivors to teach. It must be totally voluntary. And it requires separating a person's values from their behaviors. Because people have this interior good opinion of themselves 
that they don't always display with the most well thought out words or behaviors. I mean, we all have better opinions of ourselves than we actually manifest externally. That's called cognitive dissonance. And you're going to be uncomfortable being a bridge builder. So learn to live and enjoy that discomfort and accept that people have diverse opinions and experiences. And there's a woke scale, but there is not a woke competition also called the oppression Olympics because, and you need to understand the difference between those two things and also understand the difference between problematic allies and opponents. All of my allies have issues. I and mean, so if I want to find perfect people to do human rights work with, I'm gonna be one lonely girl because all of my allies, allies have issues. And as a matter of fact, people who have experienced trauma are the ones drawn to the human rights movement. So why should we be surprised that we're working with a whole lot of traumatized people when the nature of the work attracts traumatized people like a magnet? But allies with issues are not the problem. We need to know how to separate our allies with issues from our actual opponents, people who want to practice white supremacy, practice fascism, overthrow our democracy, for example, and let go of what you can't control because nobody has that magic superpower to change other people. If that power existed, couples wouldn't fight, families wouldn't fight, lovers wouldn't fight, teams wouldn't fight. I mean, we don't have that power. All we can do is offer the information and hope that the person has the wisdom and the grace to accept it. So let me just dissect calling out for a little bit more. It's criticizing other people's social justice perspectives. Generally speaking though, most people are so critical of what everybody else does, ain't at all critical of what they do. And it weaponizes knowledge. I've seen a lot of times when people just learn a concept yesterday and they suddenly want to talk down to somebody who doesn't know what they know. You know, I'm like, excuse me, you don't even know what most of the words you're using are, and yet you wanna use them as a way of virtue signaling how more woke you are versus somebody else. And they wanna banish people for not being as woke as they are. And I find people using the human rights movement as their personal therapy spaces because they wanna use social activism to boost their ego or to get affirmations that they can't get any other way or they're standing in community and then there's the weaponization of trauma as if, you know, I have experienced this. So I've got the right to hurt other people because I am hurting myself, hurt people, hurt people kind of thing. And unfortunately, surviving trauma only makes you a survivor. It doesn't necessarily make you wise. And it certainly doesn't make you superior to someone else. And then there's a lot of seeking of political purity of opinions through ideological bullying and shaming of people. That's the call out culture. I think people do it because they wanna end the harm and abuse. They do wanna be heard and respected and respond to the harm that we call each other. Those are sometimes the good uses of call out. And sometimes they wanna draw attention to unmarked uh, vulnerabilities of people and validate the pain that people are going through. And that's a good use of call out but then it can be used to show off knowledge and gain respect or establish superiority or seek that positive attention or simply de define the in crowd, who should be in and who should be out like a Mean Girls movie. Natalie Wynn is a friend of mine and she talks about the seven stages of calling in, calling out culture. First of all, there's a presumption of guilt instead of a presumption of innocence. And so somebody may say something that Somebody says, well, Joe just said something racist. And then Joe's racist statement is so quickly abstracted, the next thing you hear is that Joe is a racist. So this racist statement has been essentialized and attached to Joe's character by abstraction. And then the people doing this essentializing and attaching to Joe's character then get really moralistic about it. Oh, I know what racism is. I've experienced it. And Joe is definitely a racist. And I can give you this detailed analysis with my pseudo intellectualism about why Joe is definitively a racist. And we have to not forgive Joe for being a racist 
and never forget that Joe ever said that thing. And so then, and if you hang out with Joe, you're going to get the political lead. So there's a contamination and an infection of others when Joe has already been called a racist. So if I find you eating with Joe, well, then that must mean you're a racist too. And then that's all based on these false step binaries and dualism that I talked about before. And so calling out becomes very toxic because it replicates the prison industrial complex that we say we're all trying to fight. You know, it create it discourages people from wanting to enjoy the learning process, the struggle process, the joy of being in the human rights movement. And it frightens people into not speaking up for fear that they're gonna be the next targets. So it becomes a very toxic atmosphere. While people actually think they're doing the right thing, they're doing it the wrong way. And it can drive people away from the movement or from the teamwork they're supposed to be engaged upon, engaged in. And it's usually is an attempt to disguise what privilege you have. You know, so when you can weaponize your wokeness, that's about privilege. You know, and there's no denying that. And in fact, it's going to decrease the likelihood that you'll achieve accountability because why would anybody confess that they've done something wrong if everybody's going to jump down on their throats for having told the truth? What you're going to encourage with the call out culture is for people to lie. And so that's going to make accountability very difficult. And that increases the harm rather than healing. And it devalues and gaslights people actual lived experiences because you haven't asked at all in this process, you know, what's going on with you, Joe, that made those words come out of your mouth? Do you mind telling me what's going on with you? Do you mind if we go have coffee and talk about it, Joe? Uh, maybe you didn't mean it that way. Joe, tell me more. And then it isolates people instead of unifying them. And it creates, which is most pernicious, a culture of cynicism and helplessness. And so this horizontal hostility has to be solved. And I call it my understanding your circle of influence or your don't waste your time strategy. Most of us on this webinar are in the 90% circle. And the reason I call it 90% is not the volume of population that we represent, but the high level of political unity that we probably represent. Because we know all the right buzzwords, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, xenophobia, capitalism, neoliberalism, all ableism, all the things that we fight. The problem with the call out culture as a 90 percenter is that we spend too much time trying to turn each other into 100 percenters. As if we believe that if somebody's beliefs don't perfectly align with my beliefs, then they're doing something wrong because I know I'm doing it right. That is less than useful. It's okay to have differences because just because I work on women's rights doesn't mean everybody that I align myself with also has to work on women's rights. They just have to make sure that they don't work on women's rights in a racist or a homophobic or a transphobic way. Outside of the 90 percenters or the 75 percenters, those would be people who don't have the same buzzwords that we use, but they have values that we can resonate with. For me as a feminist, I would consider the Girl Scouts my 75 percenters. They don't like all the fancy words that I use about neoliberal capitalism and white supremacy and stuff. And they're never going to lead the troop into protecting an abortion clinic. But at the same time, the Girl Scouts believe in girls and women's empowerment. And I believe in girls and women's empowerment. And so we have enough of a shared value system that they are my most probable allies in order to build power to stop human rights violations. And outside of the 75% are the 50 percenters. Now the 50 percenters, uh, and I'm talking about again, degree of unity with my 90% politics, these would be people like my parents. Because my father was a military man, 26 years in the army, very conservative, very patriotic, immigrant from Jamaica. So he thought that he was out American Americans kind of 
guy. And my mother was a Southern Christian evangelical woman who believed that birth control was a Bible held between the knees. And so we didn't have a whole lot of common ground when I was coming up. But once my mother was trying to, to you know, ask me what I did for a living, and the only way I knew to describe it to her was to put it in a framework of her values that she would understand. And so I asked her, mom, do you remember when I was a Girl Scout, you made us cook food to feed homeless people? And she said, yes. She said, well, I said, well, you feed the hungry. As a human rights activist, I ask why they're hungry in the first place. Do you see that I'm living out your values in a different way? And that's how we have to learn to talk to the 50 percenters. It's not that we have to use our fancy words and our elite attitudes, but go underneath what they are saying to speak to their values. Like, Uncle Frank, I know that you're a fireman and you'd rush into a building to save a Black person because you wouldn't care what their race was. You're going to save them. So why would you say that kind of problematic thing about Black people at the Thanksgiving table? What is, what is, why aren't you being the kind of Uncle Frank that I know you are versus the Uncle Frank that thinks that all Black people are criminals? I mean, just using as an example, we can talk to the Uncle Franks of the world. Who we can't talk to are the 25 percenters because they're the ones who don't share enough worldview with us as 90 percenters. Their definition of freedom is the freedom not to wear a COVID protective mask, for example, where my definition of freedom is my responsibility to the rest of humanity and to put on a mask. And so they're the ones that are going to not understand my worldview. And I don't have a big understanding of theirs either. And so I would say, don't try to flip them because it ain't gonna happen. Then outside of them are the actual white supremacists and the neo-fascists and again, you're not going to have enough worldview with them to change them. But you can work strategically with the 90 percenters, the 75 percenters, and the 50 percenters. And that means that's what we must do, you know, and put pressure. It's the 90 percenters that are going to work with the 75, the 75s that are going to work with the 50. The 55s may have influence with the 25, and the 25s may have influence with the zero. But as 90 percenters, as far as we can realistically anticipate, we will have an influence, we'll be with the 50 percenters. The problem is, is that we wanna leap over the, the 75 and the 50s and try to influence the 25s and the zeros. And instead, what the last 50 years has proven is that those trends have actually gone the wrong way. So the people who imbibe the white supremacist ideology who do want to deconstruct democracy are having influence going the wrong way. And often because of our call out culture, we're failing to consolidate enough of a firewall with the 25, I mean, with the 75 and the 50% people to ensure that they stay with us instead of go the other way. Instead, we're arrogant enough to think we can just leap over people and somehow flip the Nazis and that's not happening. And so let's review what is calling in. It's a chance for self-reflection. It's a chance to offer an apology for something you've done harmful, or even if it ain't true, somebody's accused you of doing something harmful. It doesn't even have to be true. You can still offer an apology. Take a minute to think about what you did or said. You can offer to repair the harm if harm happened, and you can commit to changing your behavior by remembering the broader context Staying calm and asking for more information or clarification, using your loving listening practices, and being grateful for the opportunity to learn together. So that ends my presentation right now. Let me stop the share and see if there are any questions that you'd like to ask me. And uh, thank you. Welcome back, facilitators. Hi, so that, that presentation was really great. I enjoyed hearing um, about um, calling out and calling in. And we have our first question, which is, 
Could you explain how to identify white savior compl complexity? Well, I counter white savior complex with a concept that I call appropriate whiteness. I'm sorry. I set the timer so in case I went over. Anyway, called appropriate whiteness because the white savior complex is born out of a lot of white fear, a lot of white guilt, white fragility, and white shame. And so I say that there is a way to be appropriately white where you reclaim a white identity without the violence and the rhetoric of white supremacy, without the ideology of white supremacy. So instead of trying to save somebody else, why don't you save yourself? Recapture your own humanity by learning what white pride means without white supremacy. Learning like Toni Morrison said, to be human without wealth to forget those hatreds you learned in the sandbox. Let, make that your project instead of trying to save some other people. Because in fact, if you save yourself, by that definition, you will be saving others. But don't do it as a missionary thing. I've got to save these poor people. When in fact, you have not dealt with the contradictions within your own soul. And I think that appropriate whiteness is a way to embrace a white identity with joy centering human rights in your frame because you get to determine how you want to live your whiteness differently without subscribing to white supremacy. So our second question is, how can one sustain calling in mentality and your empathy muscle when experiencing harm from insensitive comments or actions? Well, first of all, if you're not in a space where those those insensitive comments and hap, uh, you know actions kind of roll off your back, then you're not in a calling in mind space because you need to be your number one priority. Your self healing needs to be your number one priority. So you can't put anybody's needs ahead of your own because that doesn't make sense. And so make sure that you're attending to your own healing first. And after you've been in that path a sufficient length of time, that's when you're able to call somebody in. I mean, when I was, you know, a rape survivor as a kid, I wasn't in a calling in space to talk to rapists who were, in car who were incarcerated, who had raped and murdered women. But once I saw to my own healing, then I was able to hear their stories, of how their, how, how the rapists had been produced, how they had been violated as children. And so it normalized the rape culture for them. But I couldn't have heard that if I hadn't attended to my healing at first. You have no obligation to call people in. It has to be voluntary. And if somebody tries to make you call them in, it's just like, you know, somebody walking to, up to you and say, explain white supremacy to me. I ain't got time to do my homework. And you can just say, talk to the hand, because I'm not investing in someone who's not willing to invest in themselves. That was a really great answer for our next question. Um, how can you call yourself in? I know that you mentioned in the example about the Vogue um, woman who was unfortunately terminated from her position, but when you kind of have that history where you know that maybe you know something that you might have said like in the past might someday reappear, you know, how can, like what steps can you take to address that? Well, the first thing I say that I've learned much through much pain and being called out a whole lot is if you know something bad about yourself, run and tell it first. Be the first one to tell the story because then you can, that's the only condition under which you can control the narrative. If you wait for somebody else to tell it on you, they're going to use it, maybe use it as a gotcha moment and stuff. So there's that. Now, I think that that young woman from Vogue was just inappropriately fired because all of us have been stupid teenagers and we're lucky that nobody had a cell phone around capturing everything we did as a stupid teenager <laughs> or we not, none of us would be ever able to get a job or admitted to school or whatever and so that's why we need this culture of forgiveness but the other thing is that if you have done something problematic or bad learn how to make an effective apology for it. 
own that the harm was done, offer to make reparations for the harm that you've done, and show what you're going to do better in the future. There are ways to recover from anything because all we are is simply being human. I mean, nobody, you know, Jesus already got the job of perfection, so we're just human. And so if you choose to walk in this world with your integrity, then you need to be able to own your stuff in that kind of way. I always say, I quote Lois McMaster Bougeot because she's my favorite science fiction writer. I think I, I don't know if I mentioned I majored in chemistry and physics, so I'm a STEM girl. Anyway, Lois says that your reputation is what others think they know about you, but your integrity is what you know about yourself. So guard your reputation, I mean, guard your integrity, damn the reputation, because you'll never control what other people think about you anyway. And so if you walk with your integrity as your value system, then you're going to be responsible for the harm that you do, and you're going to try to repair it and not do it again. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have another question about how can one recognize ignorance or lack of education from willful, um, willful, willful ignorance and intention to harm? Well, generally, I accept that everybody makes mistakes. It's how you handle those mistakes that determine whether I'm going to call you in or call you out. Because if you make a mistake and then you deny that you made a mistake and you deny that you harmed somebody, and in fact, you double down and try to justify that mistake, then chances are I'm gonna call you out. But if you make a mistake and you own that you make a mistake and you own that you possibly harmed somebody and that you're gonna try to do better and repair the harm that you've done, then that really increases the chances that I'm gonna call you in. Owning your mistakes is called adulting. Only kids want to hide the broken glass under the carpet, you know, <laughs> kind of thing, and hope that nobody notices. But when you show maturity in how you handle mistakes, that's when I'm going to invest time in you because you've shown that you're capable of growth and you don't want to be one of those hurt people, hurting people. But if you double down and don't want to admit that you made a mistake, then you tee yourself up for the call out. So for our next question, kind of going back into calling in and calling out, I know that some times you can see people that are actively calling out someone for doing something and it happens a lot over social media. So the question is, how can we address those that choose to call out instead of calling in, or should we address them? In my trainings, I talk about intervening in a calling out. I didn't have the bandwidth to do it tonight, but yeah, there's ways you can intervene in a call out. There's sample startup sentences you can use, like, oh my goodness, we were just having a great conversation and then everything changed. Can we back up and see what happened? You know, just stop. Thing, being willing to, to just put a pause. There's a woman who teaches the usefulness of ouch roll. Uh, I've forgotten her name right now. It's in my book, but I've forgotten her name. But she says when, when something is blurted out that you didn't mean to say, you say oops. Or when something body says something that doesn't land on you right, that hurts a little bit, you say ouch. And if things are going too fast for you, you say, whoa, slow down, <laughs> you know? So oops, ouch, and whoa, you can use those kinds of calling in techniques to sometimes stop a call out from happening and most importantly, prevent it from escalating. Because a lot of people assume that they're supposed to do social justice activism by being hypercritical of everybody else's social justice activism. And that is so wrong. That is so wrong because there's many pathways up to a mountaintop. There's, many, there's as many ways to fight oppression as there are ways to be oppressed. And so you can't assume that you've gotten the magical formula for how everybody should be doing it. Yeah. 
And we have another question about, um, like, could you explain more about how call out culture um, splinters like social social justice work um, and how calling culture can work to like unify it? In the 70s, we used to call it trashing. We didn't have the nice word of call out, but it would be people gossiping behind your back, but they'd never tell you things to your face. And so then start people start looking side at it and you don't even know why they're doing it, but you just know that something's going on because when you walk into a room, all conversations stop because you know they were talking about you kind of stuff. And so that's what we used to call trashing. And when people don't feel welcomed in a group, when people don't feel that they're learning anything or experiencing any joy and happiness in doing the work, then they're not gonna hang around with a bunch of Debbie, hypercritical Debbie Downers. You're gonna drive people away from you the same way. I don't know if anybody ever has a friend that never has anything good to say about somebody else. Trust me, those are the people that people run from because they're afraid that they're gonna, that you're gonna be next, that they not say anything good about, you know what I'm saying? And so don't be that person. Don't walk through the world thinking you're doing right. And in fact, you're driving people away from you and splintering the work because you're more invested in being seen as being right, as being collaborative and not accepting that you don't have the humility to accept that you might be wrong. Even though you're fundamentally convinced that you're right, you actually could be wrong. And even if you're right, you could be damn inconvenient when it's time to build unity and you're trying to turn a 75 percenter into a 90 percenter. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question, sorry, let me just pull this up. Submitted is, do you think calling out culture is worse in the age of social media or just different? And do you see opportunities for social media to support calling in instead of canceling? I don't know if it's worse. It's certainly more viral and it gets magnified. I mean, before you just had to, to, to get to, to get a, a, a mob together, you had to actually physically meet and work with people. Now it's just about you're doing it with strangers online, people you don't even know. You're, you're, you're getting a, a mob together electronically. And the problem is that mob, by definition, has a short attention span. So you're not actually making friends. <laughs> you're actually just summoning a mob. And then you have to escalate your call outs to get their attention back. And so it becomes an attention economy, uh, an attention grab, not actually solidarity or standing with anybody. And so, but I don't think the, the impulse to call people out is anything new. I mean, actually the original definition of the term call out was inviting somebody to a duel. That's how Alexander Hamilton got killed. <laughs> you call somebody out. That literally was the original definition of the term call out and stuff. And so obviously it's been around for as long as there's been humanity throwing grief on each other, you know, that's the kind of thing. But there is something about the technology that makes it more viral. I call it, you know, the road rage of the internet. You know, except instead of just giving the finger to one car, you're just giving it to a whole universe of people trying to call them out and cancel them. I think that on the internet, I've learned to not quick twitch. Don't just respond with the first thing that comes in my mind. I try to put pause on myself because I've done some unfortunate call outs on the internet that bounce back against me. For example, you know, as y'all know from my bio, I helped create the theory of reproductive justice along with 11 under women. And so this young woman decided to put out there to some funders that she had created the theory of reproductive justice and she said it over the internet. And I was so outraged at her. I put her on full internet blast using all of my power. Because Black women, we got issues about intellectual theft, you know? So I put her on full internet blast. Do you know what happened? 
because I had so much more power and age over this young girl, I got defined by that internet crowd as her bully. You know, when I, in my perception, I was just defending myself. But they don't know all the background story. They just know that I just put this young girl on blast and she was able to cry better than me. You know? And so it's instances like that I've learned don't do that quick Twitch call out thing because it probably won't work out the way you think it's going to work out because actually everybody's going to be looking side at it you when all they know about you is that you are doing the calling out. I was a call out queen till I learned that. Now I don't do it anymore. Kind of going off of that um, and you also mentioned in your presentation about how like there is a bit of like a generational difference surrounding like calling in or calling out um, or like actively calling in, I guess. So like, and you also shared your model of like uh, 90 percenters and 20 to 25 percenters. But, you know, I recently had um, an experience like trying to explain, I guess, the Black Lives Matter movement to my parents who are like immigrants. And so like, how would you suggest like going about that because it's someone like very close and they have like their very already like set kind of set in stone like values and beliefs so how would you suggest like approaching um that without you know wading into like canceling your own parents I guess <laughs> it's probably not a good idea to cancel your own parents uh, but I would say that from them being immigrants they showed a lot of bravery. They showed a lot of resilience to pick up and come to a whole nother country, to take that risk of coming to an entire country. So maybe your conversation is, mom and dad, I really do appreciate the risk that you took to, to come here, to raise your family, probably some racism that you had to experience to do so, some homophobia or xenophobia to do so. And so I want to know why the parents I know that have all of those great qualities can't extend the, that, that grace and forgiveness to other people who are taking risks to call out injustices who are trying. How, how, how am I, as your daughter, should I recognize the good people, reconcile the good people I know you are with the words coming out of your mouth? That's one way to have the conversation. But you always assure them that you love them and that you value them and itemize what you see good in them as a precursor to asking them about their opinions and what they stand. Does that make sense? Yeah. It works out almost every time. Because <laughs> people love to be heard, respected, appreciated. You know, we're all humans that way. But when you start off, criticizing their words, then they're immediately feeling unheard, unrespected, and unrepreciated. Now, that was a really good answer. Um, I'm going to take notes because I have like a similar situation. Don't we all? <laughs> yes. Don't we all? Um, so, but for our next question uh, is, you mentioned that there are unconscious habits that we need to stop. Can you give examples of what some of those are and how can we recognize them when we're doing them ourselves? For me, my, my most unconscious habit is stereotyping somebody because of their race and their gender. And so if a white man said, you know, comes up to me and starts talking to me, I am already have a stereotype about him before he's even opened up a word, his mouth. And so I have to put pause on my stereotype in order to pay attention to what they're actually saying, kind of thing, because I have, I mean, we're so, all socialized to, to stereotype people based on the, what their social location represents to us and not understanding that there's no guarantee that this person is going to be a member of the clan because they're white and male and cisgender, you know, that kind of thing. And so those are the ways that I try to check myself 
from making stereotypes. And the other, the other way can be just as damaging too. Because if you assume that everybody's black and female is gonna support you, you're gonna be in a world of trouble, <laughs> you know? Because that's not how humanity works. And so those are ways that I want to work on and do better with. I'm not sure if I answered your question, did I? Yeah, I think the question was answered. Um, and so I think this will be our last question. Um, it says, how do you think call-out culture will impact our society long-term in addition to individuals adopting the principles that you discussed, what can society do to reverse this trend and adopt calling in? I think we can, we can learn calling in techniques. That's so easy. Now, what's hard is you know what to do. The hard part is actually doing it. It's like you know, deciding to do an exercise routine. You know what you need to do. It's just hard to do it kind of thing. Uh, and so it's a process because you're not going to get it right the first time. And, but you, you know, like riding a bicycle, you just keep trying and trying until you get it, get it done. Um, it is very, but these are really learnable, easy steps. We just have to shift that paradigm and shift from thinking that our job is to call people out. And in fact, our job is to call people in. If your desire, if your desire is to end human rights violations, now if you got another agenda, maybe it won't work for you. But I'm passionate about ending the harm people do to each other. And I believe that the vast majority of people harming people don't want to harm people. There's still the zeros and the 25s out there. I got that. I got a whole different strategy for them, okay? But for everybody who's not in that zero and 25, I think that I can work with them by paying close attention to them, by taking their point of view and their suffering as seriously as I take my own and being able to put aside my reaction to them so that I can give them that intent, loving attention and see how we can figure out a way to work together. I think that that is the most successful strategy. And I think our world is doomed if we don't figure it out. Because white supremacy, only language is violence. And I want another language. I don't want that. I don't want violence to become my language too. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you so much for all of your answers to the questions that we had for tonight. And now I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Colon for the outro. Awesome. Thank you so much, Loretta. I was literally shaking my head the whole time and just affirming and also contemplative about, you know, how we can actually engage some of this work. Uh, it, it is, uh, it, there was something very powerful about just uh, acknowledging where we are and particularly in diversity, equity, inclusion work. It's just so, uh, it, it is everyone's responsibility. So I thank you for reminding us that we can do all different types of angles. Uh, thank you for all the, the years you've put into your work, uh, even looking at your bio. I was amazed at just the, the, the intense work and uh, just the goodness that you put out there into the world. So I uh, just wanted to thank you and pay homage to, to those that definitely uh, lay the foundation. Um, so thank you again for the conversation. My name is Joseph Colon. Uh, I, I didn't introduce myself. I'm the director for the Office of Multicultural Affairs at Johns Hopkins University. I'm under the Office of Student Life. Um, and again, on behalf of our university, we thank you. We thank our audience, especially our students who are participatory. We thank our faculty and staff that joined us today. Uh, for supporting this event. We hope that you continue to dialogue and engage in difficult conversations. I think that's always a hard place to, to come from. And also to push through with some of this equity work. And I use the word equity because there's so much that, uh, that we can come at it. And everyone wants to be affirmed, everyone wants to be connected and everyone uh, wants to be equitable. Um, and so we can come from a, a space there, that core principle and idea really can really provide us with more dialogue. 
Uh, I still want you to think about your role and how you can be activated to engage this work with the plan and authenticity. I think that's another piece. And then think about what the sustained approach would look like and how you wanna own maybe some of those pieces that would add value to your community. So again, we're, we're so glad to be able to be partnering up with you, uh, with the Provost Office, uh, the SNN, SNF Agora Institute to make sure that this conversation happens. Um, thank you for our student moderators. Kudos to you all, Melanie and Mufi uh, from Flock and MLC. Thank you all for volunteering to be a part of this. This was really an excellent opportunity to showcase your talents and the investments that you put forth to all of our students uh, and our community at large. Uh, so these premier student leaders, you know, y'all did an amazing job and I want to thank you for that investment. And I want to thank everyone else tuning in. Uh, hopefully you will rewatch this. I know I will. I'm gonna be making sure I, I have uh, more more pen and pad. I'm old school like that. So I didn't use the computer. I probably, probably would have missed out some stuff. But um, again, a recording of today's conversation will be available at the snfagora.jhu.edu uh, and the SNF Agora YouTube channel. So thank you again for spending this hour with us. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Loretta, for spending your evening with us and uh, stay safe and healthy. All bye right. Bye-bye.